good afternoon uh, for those of you on the East Coast. It is Tuesday, January 17th, and this is our first webinar for 2023, almost in 2022. I don't know. I don't think I've been dating things that way. I think I've been managing to get over to 2023. Uh, soon to be the Lunar New Year. I think it starts next Sunday. 22nd, maybe Sunday. Anyhow, the year of the rabbit, the year of the water rabbit. And the water rabbit, um, in my very cursory research, um, which I will not have to uh, support because it has nothing to do with markets. So the SEC doesn't care what I say, I don't think, about the water rabbit. The water rabbit um, is a symbol of peace and prosperity. So, um, that's a that's a happy positive sign. There are probably some shadow signs. There's always shadow signs, things of this nature. But it, that's a, I think it's a good for me. That's a way of um, summarizing my my own feelings about 2023. But they are just feelings. These are not. This is not an official uh, market prediction. Uh, I want to give you some data points for your consideration of where we are at this moment. Um, so I have a few charts to share with you, but let's start with what has actually taken place in the last year. And I'm going to start by showing you a chart uh, that is uh, indicative of uh, what actually happened in the, I, and this isn't just 20, I'm going to show you something. It's not, it's not just 2022, it's actually the, the rolling 12 months. So you should be able to see my, my chart from Y charts that I created, a simple little chart that shows various, uh, using various proxies for asset classes, what the heck has happened in the last 12 months. Uh, this down 26%, that is uh, NASDAQ 100. So I'm using it as a proxy for the broader NASDAQ index. As most of you on this call would know, and probably those of you who are listening know that that's a pretty decent measure of quote, quote unquote growth oriented companies really took it on the chin in 2022. Um, the S&P also down 14.4, but that's a pretty big spread between the two of them. Um, so the S&P held up a little better, but the the story of the, the, the at least demise in 2022 of the 60, 40 portfolio, 60% equity, 40% on is this, uh, proxy here for the aggregate bond, the, the Barclays ad, down almost 9% over the last 12 months. And the even short-term treasuries, the one to three year treasuries, down 4%. So if you look at your own portfolios, you look at what's happening in the market, as you already know, um, the story was um, really the only sector of the market that did well at all. Um, was energy, specifically carbon energy, not, not renewables, um, because those companies tend to be a little bit growthier. So it was a pretty rough year. Um, and um, as I mentioned in my last webinar of the year, uh, last month, um, historically, um, we don't tend to get back-to-back -back negative years. It can happen. Um, it has happened. But historically, it is not the norm. So hopefully this year will be better. And this started off better. In fact, if I just change the uh, change this one little thing here and show you year to date, you can see that things are already sort of improving out of the gate. We'll see how long they last. NASDAQ's up 5.45% year to date. S&P's up four. Uh, I do not know why this Bloomberg advocate is broke off at at January 13th, that's something going on with y charts. I'm not sure, but it's up. And of course, short-term treasuries are flat, which is what we would more or less expect them to be. So that's what happened. Now, where are we? And sort of what, what are the macroeconomic things going on? What's, what's the story? Um, what's interesting, uh, and everybody I listen to keeps saying the same thing. The picture is very uh, conflicted. So the two things 
uh, all, all of 2022 was characterized by watching the Fed raise rates and their, their eyes are still on the Fed. Will the Fed continue to raise rates? Will they slow? Are we entering in a recession? Are we already in a recession, et cetera? Um, and we're getting very, we have very, very conflicting data. So I will show you uh, the classic yield curve chart. This is where we're at in the yield curve. A one month uh, treasury now yielding 4.5%, a one year yielding almost 4.7, a two year less at 4.1, a 10 year less at 3.5, and a 30 year at 3.6. So classic uh, inverted yield curve that has um, accurately predicted um, the last seven recessions. So we're definitely in an inverted yield curve. Uh, Interestingly, uh, the other day, I was listening to Bloomberg Radio, which I like to do, and um, one of the folks they were interviewing was the person who first noticed this correlation of inversion on these, uh, on these spreads and recessions. I think he said, and I can't, I'll have to go, I'll have to look him up. I can't remember the guy's name. He's an academic. I think he said he spotted it, and it may have been his PhD dissertation. It's been around a long time. He was on the radio making a case for why this, uh, this predictor, this uh, correlation, may no longer hold. And he was, he was suggesting that despite the fact that the yield curve is inverted, um, there were reasons to believe we would not be headed into a recession. And his argument related mostly, interestingly, to the fact that the market and has so latched on to this correlation. That is to say, everyone believes that it is accurate. And in the belief that it is accurate, um, uh, market participants, uh, you know, large corporate CEOs make adjustments in anticipation of a recession, and thus a recession may not, in fact, happen. Essentially, because we know it might, or, or we believe it will, it won't. I mean, that's that's a very flat-footed way of making this argument. It was much more nuanced than that. Um, you can probably Google it and find find this person if you're interested. But I thought that was I thought that was pretty interesting. So that's but but if we if we believe this indicator, um, and there are a lot of people talking about this spread, um, then, uh, you know, it's it's one indication that we may end up uh, in a recession. Now, let's look to the uh, a big oppositional position on this, and that is GDP now. For those of you who have tuned into my webinars before, you know this is one of my favorite places to hang out. So this is the Atlanta Fed. The GDP now cast tries to use up to the minute data. It has some sort of computer model and it's projecting not what, you know, it's using that data, it's, it's trying to give us a sense of where we're actually at. And you'll see that the GDP now model estimates that fourth quarter 2022, actually the, the GDP actually grew at 4.1%. Now notice this, the consensus range here, the blue chip consensus, meaning what the what most economists say, right, is actually that it's, you know, just over 1%. So the, the narrow cast is like dramatically above what the rest of the um, rest of the economists are suggesting. So that's, that would, uh, that would argue <coughs> for the fact that we're, we're, we're not only not in a recession, we may not be headed into a recession. Uh, so, um, but we have to, the, the, the countervailing, again, the, uh, the opposite, opposite of this thought of this would be, well, but if the economy is still running this hot, and if the labor market is as tight as it appears to be, and it is very tight, um, then that would also imply that inflation was going to remain elevated, that the Fed was going to have a very hard time getting it back to 2%, which is what they are saying they want it to be. Some of the people I'm listening to are saying, well, 
you know, we're, certainly the pace of inflation has slowed dramatically. Um, we're now looking at something like 6%. Um, I've heard people say it's going to be easy to get to four, but getting back to two is going to be very, very hard. So they expect the Fed to do what it says it's going to do, which is continue to tighten, um, albeit at a slower pace. Right now, the market participants are pricing in something like a 90% probability that we get a 25 basis point hike at the beginning of February, not a 50% or 50 basis point hike. Um, the other thing, though, that the Fed is doing, which is important to keep an eye on, is they are beginning to do what's called reduce their balance sheet. So we've talked about this before in the webinars in, um, in, in, during the uh, pandemic. Uh, you, you can just see the Fed um, going in and buying up assets in the form of treasuries, mostly some mortgage-backed securities, at just a parabolic rate to just force an enormous amount of liquidity into the system and keep us out of what arguably might have been a depression and not even just a recession. That's going to be this. Okay, so we get this huge increase, huge amounts of liquidity. And they have said, and they're doing what they said they're doing, that they are gradually going to begin to roll off. So as treasuries mature, they're not rebuying them. They're just allowing those treasuries to go back into the market. And um, so you've got more supply and you've got the buyer of last resort, which was the Fed, no longer buying. Want to think about that. A lot of supply, fewer buyers. What does that imply? It implies to get buyers to buy, um, the yield has to be higher. So if that has the effect of tightening, it has the effect of reducing the money supply and tightening conditions which again is, is sort of the, the, the dual thing they're doing. They're not just raising short-term rates, but they're not actually entering the market to buy. So we should continue to see tightened conditions. So what does this mean? Well, it, it means that if rates remain high um, or continue to rise and then remain high for a longer period of time, um, you know, theoretically at least, um, that should slow down the economy which should slow down earnings or reduce earnings or constrict profitability on companies. And as a consequence, um, stock prices should uh, decline. And that right now is the concern. It's like, will, will earnings hold up? Is the economy strong enough to not end up in a recession? Uh, and are companies strong enough to uh, manage still the profitability that justifies their price or their price to earnings ratio. Because price is at least fundamentally a function of the company's earnings. So again, depending on who you listen to, um, uh, there are some folks who are saying that the market is still overvalued. It hasn't fully taken into account um, the earnings recession we are headed, headed towards. Um, it hasn't fully taken into account the fact that the Fed uh, is going to continue to tighten. Um, some people will argue that what's priced into the market right now is actually the Fed pivoting. You've heard that term, I'm sure, in the media. Pivoting and actually beginning to reduce um, you know, interest rates. So it's, yeah. I hope you're getting, uh, getting the picture. But, you know, when in doubt, why don't we look at what just regular people think? Okay. Here's this across my de desk yesterday. I, I subscribe to this uh, these visual maps of financial, various types of financial measurements. And this one was, well, the global stock markets crash in 2023, what are the results? Well, they just interviewed regular people all over the world. And uh, what they found was the average indicates that 50% of the world's population believes that it is likely that there will be a major stock market crash around the world in 2023. I don't, they don't, I read this thing carefully. They don't really define crash. I'm not sure what that means. Um, but your average uh, person, and I don't know that they're even necessarily the average investor. I think they're just regular folks, um, think that it's likely that the market will crash. 31% think it's unlikely. If you look back and, you know, uh, over, over various countries, let's go to the United States, you know, 46% uh, of folks thought it would happen in 
2019, 45%. So, you know, I don't know if this really means it. I, I would say it probably is. It, I, the, most of the time, um, average people are wrong <laughs> about the market. <laughs> so, I don't know. Maybe this sort of augurs for um, my position, my sort of kind of somewhat bullish position that we will end the year in a positive note. So, um, you know, the long and the short of it, I'm going to stop sharing the screen now. Um, the long and the short of it is that it's a, uh, uh, what, oh, question, what year did you say they anticipated? Yeah, 2023. Of course, we already arguably had quite a significant crash in 2022. Um, uh, it, it's a very, very muddy picture. Um, that is the norm in markets. Um, usually, at least in my experience, and again, this is anecdotal, I've been doing this about 20 years. I would just say that um, when everybody is clear and there's a clear consensus and everybody's on one side, that's usually when things are the most dangerous. Um, so in some ways, this sort of unclear picture is not an entirely bad thing for a long-term investor. Um, there are certainly one of the things that's clear to me, and I, 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 I don't think this is a, I think I've got this right. I think that there's um, this normalization of interest rates uh, is, is in the longer term, it seems to me, a healthier thing. It's certainly a healthier thing for garden variety savers. For those of you who like to keep around a fair amount of cash, you know very well that you have been making zip on that cash. Now, inflation rates were low, so you weren't necessarily you weren't necessarily losing money. You might have been losing some, um, but it certainly is a better time to be a saver, and it will become and and we could see actually like net real returns in savings if we can get inflation back to even three percent, and you can invest now in even a you know, two year treasury and get four percent. That's a net real return. Things start to look a little bit more normal. Bonds begin to behave a little bit more like we would want them to in a portfolio and not just a place to hang out because we don't want everything in equities. Um, so I think that that's, that's a positive. Um, I'm not, these webinars are not meant to give advice. I will just say, I would, the only thing I would say is to the extent that you're holding a good bit of cash somewhere, you would you do want to take a look and see what kind of interest rate you're getting um, because if you're not going to need it for a little while there's an argument to be made for buying some treasuries um, or even shopping uh, your savings accounts for better rates of return because that certainly is happening banks have not cut up cut up to where treasuries are treasuries are definitely leading in the short term um, but you know that's that's a net positive the other thing uh, I'm not going to show you the chart, uh, but I was looking at it this morning just in terms of what are the net savings rates, the average net savings rates um, in the United States have been closer to 8%, they're down to 2%. So, and of course they spiked dramatically during COVID, things went up dramatically. A lot of stimulus money went into the, the economy. A lot of folks didn't have any place to spend it. They saved it. A lot of folks weren't traveling. You weren't going out, you weren't doing a lot of things. So net savings rates rose dramatically. Net savings rates have come down pretty significantly. Um, and that's something to keep an eye out for um, uh, because um, I would say as long as people have jobs and the, and the, um, uh, the unemployment rate remains low, people continue to spend. If we start to see um, a lot more layoffs in um, something other than tech, the majority of the layoffs so far really have come in that to the tech sector. And most of those folks seem to be able to get jobs again fairly quickly. But if we start to see significantly a, a much bigger slowdown in savings rates go negative, um, that is a pretty negative sign for the economy. So, hmm. Oh, and one last statistic that I thought, I do think is fair is watching. Uh, the Purchasing Managers Index, which is something that measures manufacturing activity in this country and has also historically 
been a sign of expansion or contraction in the, the broader economy is now at about 48 as of December. So anything below 50 is indicative of contraction. Anything 50 or above is indicative of expansion. Um, so again, that's something to keep an eye on. That's a little bit more uh, uh, evidence on the side of a slowdown. Um, the question, of course, and you, you'll hear this language all the time, can, they, can the Fed en engineer it soft landing? What does a soft landing look like? Um, we'll see. We'll see. I think that it's um, the people I'm listening to are a little less gloomy, but they're also very, um, uh, very much think that the market is arguably still too optimistic. Um, it may be a tale of two halves. We may have a situation where we have a lot more volatility in the first half of the year, the back half improves. The opposite could also be true. We'll see. Goldman Sachs. Uh, reported uh, their earnings this morning and disappointed um, and took a huge hit for it. I'm not sure how much they are down. I was just listening to, again, to the radio and heard some of that. We'll see. Uh, but part of that is, remember, the Goldman is a, um, it's a retail bank. It's a trading bank, and it's a bank that I think makes a good bit of money on mergers and acquisitions, and mergers and acquisitions are weaker than they've been because the cost of money is significantly more expensive than it was even a few years ago. So it's taking a while for the market to digest what is probably a new normal. Um, that is to say, savings rates higher, interest rates slightly higher. Um, but uh, on the other hand, depending on your perspective, the last 14 years of uh, even global negative rates was not normal from the standpoint of a much longer time horizon. So perhaps things will uh, will start to look a little bit more like they look pre uh, great financial crisis. That would be my hope, and I think that would be a good thing for all concerned. Um, I'm looking to see if there are any questions in the chat. I don't see any questions. I'm surprised that no one, I know some of you are on the call here or live. Um, is no one interested in talking about the debt ceiling? Just say yes if you want to talk about the debt ceiling, or do you just, are you guys just like, no, I don't want to talk about this. I don't want to think about it. The debt ceiling. Um, so, when was the last time we did this? Was it 2011? I forget where we we were really into when that where when Congress was really playing chicken with the debt ceiling. Um, it's been a little while, um, and it should be no surprise that um, given the political environment and the uh, the slim majority that Republicans now have in the House and the and the more importantly, the sort of ideological bent of those folks that um, that this whole controversy is coming up again. And uh, for those of you on the call, I suspect you know this, but for those of you who might be watching this on a recording, just to be clear, the, the what the debt ceiling is uh, or when it is needed to be expanded, it relates to spending that has already happened. It is not about new spending. It is not a question about what the government should spend. It's a question about honoring the debts of the United States that have already incurred. Uh, or been incurred, I should say. So, um, so it's a little like... Uh, you know, governments are not people precisely, but it's a little like somebody saying, in protest, I refuse to pay my mortgage, or in protest, I refuse to pay my credit card bill. Um, and what happens to individuals when they do that? When individuals do that, what happens is um, eventually, first of all, they're, they're uh, their credit rating goes down dramatically. They are either consistently late or refuse to pay. Um, eventually, they 
uh, if they are not otherwise deemed to be bankrupt, someone comes and takes their stuff, right? <laughs> Don't pay for your car, your car loan, somebody's going to come take your car or your house. So the implications of the United States not honoring its debts, though, is a significantly larger than any, arguably any country in the world defaulting. Why? Because the United States, uh, the United States ability to pay and honor its debts, specifically, for example, its treasury notes and bills to pay the interest, um, is, is considered, um, in a sense, the underpinning, it, I mean, I think it is not in a sense, I think it currently is the underpinning of the world economy. That is to say, there's only one risk-free asset in the world that you can invest in, and that's the U.S. Treasury. Um, if the United States, because of political instability, is perceived to be um, so uh, out of control that it will not pay its debts, um, the cost of borrowing uh, could, arguably should, skyrocket or go up dramatically, at least skyrocket and skyrocket, but you get my drift, right? So, but it also, given um, given how, <laughs> how much of the world holds U.S. treasuries and how much of the world sort of marks itself against the United States and the United States stability and its ability to pay or its willingness, it's not an ability, it's always going to be ability, willingness to pay its debt. I mean, it, it's, uh, it's almost too catastrophic to contemplate economically. I think, it, I mean, we saw some of this. We did have our credit rating reduced. I think it was 2011. Somebody needs to Google that and check me on that. It seems like it was 2011. Um, and we got through it okay. And, you know, cooler heads prevailed and yada, 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 yada. Um, but, you know, um, we can't keep doing this uh, and expect it. My concern has been, and I've said this, I think, on these webinars. I know I've said it in client meetings when conversations come up. My concern has been all along that um, someone would make a someone would make a mistake, meaning they would press it too far and unintentionally push us over some sort of financial edge. Um, I'm not sure that um, the folks who are playing with this fire even. Uh, intellectually understand. I don't think they really get what they're doing. So I'm not even sure. Yeah, you could say they're going to make a mistake, but I think it, I think it's not just make a mistake as in I know what I'm doing and I'm going to get really close to the edge and then I'm going to just slip. I think they don't really understand the edge at all. And that is a big concern. I don't know what you do about it though. I got to tell you. I mean, in terms of like, I don't know how you handicap that. Um, you know, it's one of those things that, I mean, I, I find it just uh, unbelievably annoying and worrisome. And maybe, you know, again, maybe market participants aren't taking it as seriously as we should, except I don't know what you do about how you hedge against something like that, um, short of continuing to uh, hopefully get these folks out of a position of power. I really don't. So uh, we have a ways before it becomes crisis mode, um, a ways as in some months, but you're going to be hearing a lot more about it because we're already starting to hit the ceiling and there are things that the Treasury will do. Janet Yellen has already been out front talking about this. Um, but uh, you, you're just going to hear more about it. And uh, I wish I had a better uh more to say about it other than it, it does worry me but i'm not sure I, what to do about it that's the bottom line um other questions for me today going once all right if there are no other questions i'm going to stop the recording and um, 
And then for those of you who are live with me, if you want to come back on a minute, uh, if you have something you don't want to put in the chat, I'll give you a chance to talk to me. And then otherwise, we will call it a day. So I'm going to stop the recording. Thank you all very much. And thank you for those of us who joined um, to listen to me. Thank you.